Hi friends, today we'll have an unusual but interesting video experiment. A few years ago, one of my viewers sent me a cool package with radio components. Unfortunately, it so happened that I didn't make a video with a review of this package, although I should have, given that it is simply luxurious. It had a bunch of field effect transistors, IRF540, stabilizers, AMS1117, chokes, whole bags of different capacitors, 7-segment indicators, optosemesters, relays, multi-turn trimmers and much more. Moreover, all this is in a factory packaging in quantities from 100 to 500 pieces. During this time I've partially used some of the parts, in particular relays, transistors and stabilizers. There were two bags of films capacitors, 630 volts, 47 nanofarad. Based on them, I wanted to assemble a large battery for the resonant circuit of the induction heater, so I don't touch them for now. In another package are 500 electrolytic capacitors of 470 microfarad, 16 volts. You know that I'm fond of pulse sources, but there is rarely a need for just such capacitors. Firstly, they have a small capacitance. It doesn't make sense to use them in the output part of impulse blocks, especially powerful ones, because you need to put a bunch of such capacitors. Secondly, there are only 16 volts. Even in my 12 volt sources, I almost always put capacitors with a double margin, 25 volts. And thirdly, for power sources, you need low ESR capacitors, but these aren't like that, so they lay for now. What can you do with 500 capacitors that you don't really need? Well, we take it and connect everything in parallel. Why and how you can use this mega battery of capacitors, I'll explain later. Now, let's start with capacitors. Electrolytes are for 16 volts, 470 microfarad, 105 degrees Celsius, made by LZ. During the measurements, I found that their capacity is plus or minus in tolerance. The internal resistance is about 190 to 220 milliohm, which is quite good. Then, on a piece of paper, I sketched out the characteristics of the future capacitor bank if all 500 cans are used. As a result, we get a battery with a capacity of 235,000 microfarads, or 0.235 farads. Cool. Let me remind you that these aren't supercapacitors, but just usual capacitors, and this will probably be the highest capacity battery that I have made before. Taking into account the internal resistance of each cell, in theory the total internal resistance of the battery will be in the region of 0.4 to 0.5 milliohms, and this is a very cool value. For compare, the internal resistance of a good car audio capacitors of 1 farad is 1.7 milliohm, and my, with a capacitance of only 0.23 farad, the internal resistance is several times less. Another example is a 12 volt 5400 mAh polymer battery with a current output of 30 Celsius and an internal resistance of 7.5 milliohm. In a word, a capacitor bank wins on all counts. I think everyone knows very well what an advantage of such a low internal resistance is. Such a battery is capable of giving up the accumulated energy very quickly. That is, over the same period of time, the discharge currents of the capacitors are much greater than those of supercapacitors or high current batteries. The battery energy will be about 30 joules and according to approximate calculations, I'll be able to receive currents up to 16,000 amps at the peak, but of course for a very short time. First, a huge printed circuit board was created on which I wanted to place all 500 capacitors, but then I realized that it simply wouldn't fit on an A4 paper, and the final board would be much curved, taking into account the massive reinforced polygons. Then I made smaller boards. It was planned that there would be 168 capacitors on each board, and then three such boards would be connected in parallel. The total number of capacitors on boards is 504 pieces. Soldering all this is an extremely boring, monotonous and time-consuming process. Fortunately, it wasn't me who soldered all this. Now I want to tell about our sponsor, GLCPCB, which is producing printed circuit boards of any size, shape and layers. 
The company also offers services for industrial 3D printing, the creation of soldering stencils for soldering SMD components, and the assembly of circuits. The link to the company's website you can find in the description. The tracks on all the boards were additionally reinforced with several strands of copper wire with a diameter of 1.8 mm. The boards were connected in parallel with the same wire. The weight of this colossus is 1.2 kg and at least a third of this weight is solder. The boards of course were slightly deformed from all this, but this is nothing. After two days of painstaking work, the battery was ready and it remained to be checked. During checking, two capacitors exploded, as they were put incorrectly, but this is a minimal loss taking into account the total number of capacitors. Having measured the eternal resistance of the battery, I was delighted. Even taking into account the wires, we have 0.6 milliohm, which is a very good value. Well, now let's think about where to use this colossus. I forgot to point out that if you, for example, just connect the discharge battery to a car battery, then you'll go in trouble, because the charge current of this thing is colossal. You must charge it with a current limiter, at least through an incandescent bulb. But if you connect this bunch of capacitors, for example, to the output of a powerful pulse power supply, you will get literally an analog of a battery. It will smooth out power ripples at all. In general, audiophiles should like it. That is, the first area of application is clear, smoothing out ripples of power supply. Also, for those loads that consume a large push current at startup, the battery itself can provide these currents. The next is contact welding. Recently, portable devices for contact welding of batteries using nickel plated or nickel tapes have been relevant. I have made a lot of such devices. No matter how cool the device is, it needs a powerful power source in order to weld tapes properly to batteries. The source must have the lowest possible internal resistance and maximum current output. By connecting these capacitors in parallel, even to a not very powerful battery, you'll get an ideal welding current source. I have used one farad audio capacitors for this sort of works before, and it worked great with tapes down to 0.15 mm. The new device is smaller in capacity, but can deliver high currents, so we should try using it with the Chinese resistance welding machine. The wires that I have are far from the ones that are needed, at least 16 squares are needed here, but let's try this. I'm just afraid that these FATs may not be able to stand it, although they are quite good, but let's take a chance, I'll just take glasses, otherwise it might shoot me in the eye, although I'd rather take this, maybe the battery itself will explode, in such cases you never know what will happen. Tape is nickel plated with a thickness of 0.12 mm. As a charger, a laboratory power supply is connected to the capacitor battery. The maximum charge current is 3.2 amps, that is, its effect on the welding process is very negligible, and it can be ignored. The currents here are so huge that the tape is pierced through, and at the same time there isn't the slightest hint of heating. This indicates an extremely short pulse time and a large current. Due to this, the points turn out to be small in diameter, and for reliable welding you need to weld the tape several times in different places. It is also worth trying to increase the diameter of the electrodes, thereby increasing the contact patch. The device works without problems with 0.2 mm tapes, but the result is slightly worse. I think in combination with a polymer battery, with a current output of 100 to 150 amps, you can get ideal results. Capacitors, due to their lower resistance, will work at the initial moment of welding providing a huge shock current and piercing the tape, then the battery will already finish it.
Of course, it is possible only on capacitors, but you need to increase the energy of the battery by two or three times by raising its capacity. You can also increase the voltage, but I don't advise doing this because with higher voltage welding a slight lack of contact or poor clamping will lead to a big explosion. In the end, let's measure the maximum value of the welding current. To do this, I will take a 300 amps shunt with a drop of 50 mV. Therefore, its resistance is 0.16 mOhm. The oscilloscope is connected in parallel with the shunt and will record the peak voltage drop across it. The drop on the shunt was about 4 volts, that is, the peak current reached 24,000 amperes, and this is quite possible. If you look closely at the current pulse, you can see that the pulse rise time takes only two cells, that is, one millisecond after another millisecond. We observe a decrease in current by almost two times, and then the same linear dependence. The entire pulse lasts on the order of 3.5 milliseconds, but the current reaches its peak for a very short time. Naturally, in this system we have a lot of losses on connections, on wires, and in power transistors. This concludes the video. How useful it was, only you can judge. I just remind you that you will find links to my other resources and other useful information in the description. Now, I say goodbye until we meet again. As always, with you was Cassian TV.